Hello and welcome to this special recorded briefing by the Jerusalem Press Club. I'm Jonathan Beck, Director of Content. Our special guest today is Sarit Zahavi, a former Lieutenant Colonel in the IDF and today Director of um, ALMA Center, a research and education center which focuses on Israel's security challenges along its northern borders. Uh, Sarit also lives uh, in the Western Galilee, only nine kilometers from the border between Israel and Lebanon. So for her, this is also personal. Hello, Sarit, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Um, could you please tell me, um, the attack we saw today was basically the IDF preempting a, a massive large-scale attack by Hezbollah against um, reportedly targets in Tel Aviv and elsewhere in Israel, correct? A little bit north to Tel Aviv, yes. Uh, Hezbollah wanted to carry out an, an, an attack for two areas uh, with hundreds of rockets, one to the north in order to overwhelm our aerial defense systems, and then the second one to north to Tel Aviv to uh, intelligence uh, infrastructures by, uh, you know, by the publications here in Israel, probably to intelligence infrastructures uh, north to Tel Aviv. Um, it failed. It didn't succeed. Okay. Uh, can you say, I mean, this has been similar to the maybe April 14 attack by Iran. This has been quite an impressive, uh, let's say, operation of uh, preemptive uh, strikes. Uh, but the north of Israel has been um, sustaining damage, rockets, and uh, evacuated since practically October 8, one day after the Hamas attack. Can you tell me why perhaps uh, either tactically or for other reasons, the military has not carried out more similar attacks to, to preempt Hezbollah strikes? Look, uh, Israel prioritized the south to the north, meaning that uh, most of the uh, efforts and resources were towards the south. Today, what is happening is that we understand that it's time to change uh, how should I put it, to change the approach, I'll put it this way, because we understand that the terrorist organization organizations we are neighboring, whether it's Hamas or Hezbollah, are not willing to any ceasefire. And they want to preserve, Hezbollah wants to preserve the war of attrition, and Hamas wants to preserve the hostages. In this kind of situation, what we should do is to disconnect the two fronts now, because it's a different kind of of tools, toolbox in each of these fronts and different kind of challenges today in each of these fronts. And it's time to truly uh, work with the international community, this is very important, on a, a, a realistic solution for the people of the North to bring them back home. And I think now is the moment to do it. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you're saying it was a success just like mid-April, but for us, the people that are living here, this is far from being enough because it is not changing the strategic situation of 60,000 Israelis evacuated. It's just another local ex escalation, and then everything goes back to the new normal, which shouldn't be normalized, which is daily fire of Hezbollah towards Israel's north. I understand. Um... Can you say, I mean, I know in the government, there's a few voices. Um, one of the hawkish ones is, um, not that he has a role in this, is Yoav Kish, who says, the evacuees in the north will not return before there is high intensity or a hot war with Hezbollah. Now, um, basically, the window of opportunity for this is diminishing, right? Because in the winter months, the IDF is going to prefer not to, to do the fight. So we're now coming into September. The school year is about to start. Um, and um, we still have no, uh, let's say, horizon for that. But secondly, before you uh, respond, I would like to ask also today's um, operation, so to speak, was a reaction. This was not Israel uh, preempting. I mean, this was a reaction to a move by Hezbollah. So uh, this is still just responding fire, correct? You know, the bottom line is that we are in a circle of action, reaction, action, reaction that has been going on since October 8th. And as I've said, there are, you know, a, a decrease and increase in the amount of fire and the intensity of this conflict. But the bottom line is that the strategic situation is not changing and we need to change that. 
I agree that the winter is much more challenging for fighting in Lebanon in opposed to Gaza because it's the north and the ground becomes uh, much more difficult. But at the same time, I must tell you that there are different opinions here up north of what's the solution and whether it should be a military solution. The only thing that everybody agree upon is that the solution must include the elimination of Hezbollah to carry out a massacre, just like Hamas had done in October 7th. Uh, this is something that it is clear to everybody. And yes, uh, people, uh, unless they have they don't have any other economic option, they will not come back to live nearby Hezbollah. And when we are saying nearby, we mean nearby, meters away. The communities are here are at the border. It's not even a matter of uh, one or two kilometers. It's a matter of, of feet and meters. So this is something that must be addressed. I'm not sure it could be addressed uh, in a diplomatic way. I do accept the need to try a diplomatic approach, but I think this should be limited in a deadline and it cannot, the negotiations around that could not last forever. Do you think Northern evacuees, I don't know if you could, you cannot speak obviously for all of them, but do you think, I've heard many voices saying, uh, uh, I'm not gonna trust Hezbollah to carry to, you know, to respect its word. So do you think uh, evacuees will return with just, so to speak, just a diplomatic headline, uh, whatever, by Amos Hochstein or something like that? Nobody is going to trust Hezbollah. We shouldn't trust Hezbollah. And any diplomatic agreement should include an effective monitoring mechanism in opposed to the previous one that was proved to be ineffective. It's not UNIFIL, it can't be the Lebanese army. These two players are not willing to clash with Hezbollah and they will be deceived by Hezbollah uh, just as they were deceived in the past. And choosing the word deceived, I'm not even sure because clearly Lebanese army knew exactly what Hezbollah is doing in South Lebanon. And even UNIFIL knew exactly what Hezbollah is doing in South Lebanon. And both of them choose not to clash with Hezbollah. We need to make sure that when there is a clear evidence for the military activity of Hezbollah in South Lebanon, somebody will be prepared to act against that, whether it's Israel or any other mechanism that will be established. Do you think the IDF today is uh, more um, free to go up, up to the north uh, northern border of Israel now that the war in Gaza is at least, let's put it, uh, not in high intensity anymore and the amount of forces there can be somewhat uh, dwindled? So about IDF preparedness, I do understand First, we don't know, okay? It's not being published. So I cannot uh, give you a clear answer how IDF is prepared. It is clearly much more prepared than it used to be in October 7th, okay? <laughs> Let's put it this way. I must say, I hear a lot of voices that we need a ceasefire and then uh, take care of the North. After a ceasefire that we will uh, fill our storages of weapons or our reservists will be able to rest and all of that. And I. I, I completely understand these needs, but everybody should bear in mind that if there is a ceasefire, Hezbollah will recover as well. And now the situation now is that Hezbollah is damaged. It is damaged by the IDF attacks in South Lebanon. Uh, IDF uh, killed um, almost 50 commanders of Hezbollah from field commanders to senior commanders of Hezbollah since this war started. It had bombed uh, South Lebanon with thousands of targets. This is very important uh, when we discuss the preparedness of Hezbollah as well. And I think this should be taken in consideration when we try to compare the capabilities of IDF versus Hezbollah as well. Okay, thank you for this. Uh, secondly, I would like to ask you, uh, last week, I think, Hezbollah published a uh, very well-produced video of an attack tunnel. And uh, this has made the rounds in Israel. And um, and then uh, your center, Alma Center, published, uh, republished a report by Talberi, which is not really even new. I mean, the video is new, but the tunnels aren't new. Uh, but what I would like to ask you, um, are these tunnels a, a considerable threat, considering that the IDF perhaps knows where at least some of the openings are? Are they really dangerous or can they be neutralized as as a offensive mechanism relatively early on in, in, in a possible war? 
the threat of the tunnel, you can divide it to uh, two aspects, uh, which are actually the two main threats that are coming from Hezbollah. First is the capabilities to launch rockets without being revealed. Uh, even to bring the launchers and the rockets from one area to another in Lebanon and that way uh, launch them very quickly, quickly from below the ground. And second is to transfer uh, um, Hezbollah military operatives and terrorists to be capable of infiltration and maybe even invasion in the future uh, to the Israeli communities next to the border. As for the, sec the second threat, I'm not sure that Hezbollah today is willing or capable of doing so. Um, again, maybe in the future, because the, the basic motivation is to invade into Israel and the capability existed in October 7th. But I think that today, after 10 months of fighting, the situation is a little bit different than it used to be. So the tunnels enable Hezbollah to hide. Can IDF uh, deal with this threat? Clearly, we've seen in Gaza that IDF was very successful uh, in treating these tunnels, but it takes time. It takes a long time and not everything could be done from the air. So I think that's the, that's the main challenge of how you actually eliminate the threat coming from Hezbollah while it is using underground infrastructures to hide in them. Okay, so finally, just the last question on these uh, tunnels. Uh, we know that in Gaza, there was a huge uh, metro, like a, a, basically a subterranean city of uh, almost unbelievable size and complexity. Uh, the terrain in the north is much more rocky, it's harder to drill, etc. Uh, is there any Israeli, either by Alma Center or otherwise, of uh, the scope of this tunnel network of Hezbollah? It's smaller, isn't it? We first, Hezbollah and opposed to Hamas had 40 years. And we know that they started a project in the end of the 80s. Hezbollah leaders visited North Korea to learn about uh, underground warfare and how to excavate and fight in these tunnels. So this is something that is completely not new uh, to the Lebanese in general and to Hezbollah in particular. And that's why we believe that uh, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of kilometers underground in Lebanon. By the way, for various uh, purposes, it's not just attacking tunnels. As I've said, it's also tunnels to transfer the different capabilities from one area to another. Uh, approaching tunnels that will enable them to come closer to the border probably exist as well. Tactical tunnels we see all the time in the publications of Hezbollah, uh, tunnels that will enable uh, them to carry out the fightings against uh, the IDF and to launch the rockets from South Lebanon itself, and also tunnels with explosives that may uh, collapse everything that's on top. Uh, all of this exists in the warfare of, of tunnel in the underground warfare tactic, and I believe all of this exists in Lebanon as well. Okay. Um, yesterday's uh, attack was apparently like um, as per Hezbollah stage one. Um, are you preparing in the north there to stage two or three or more? I mean, what what is this week hold in store for us? There is no special preparedness other than stay next to shelters. You don't have to stay next to shelters anymore. Stay next to shelters. You don't have to stay next to shelters anymore. This is pretty much our life in the past few months. Uh, so I don't know what else could be done. Of course, the IDF is stretched all over here and uh, we have two divisions uh, deployed uh, on the northern border. Um, again, pretty much from the beginning of the war. Uh, as I've said, IDF is much more prepared than it used to be in October 7th. But you know, as an ex-officer, I can say that there is never 100%. And we've seen this this morning, even though there was an IDF preemptive attack, we had more than 200 uh, projectiles that were launched to Israel. And even though many of them were intercepted, uh, some of them landed and there were even some hits in, in, in the area not far from where I live. understand. Okay, so um, with the wish of a quieter week and hopefully a you know, return of peace to the North, I don't know if it's gonna happen in, in, in five days for the school year, but as soon as possible. I thank you very much for your time for this conversation. Uh, Sarid Zahavi from Alma Center. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.